Hi, welcome back to The Wandering Wesleyan. I'm Chaplain Greg, and we're in our Walking Through the Word series, uh, continuing with wisdom literature. If you are enjoying what you're watching, please like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, leave a comment in the comments section. Send me an email at wanderingwesleyan at hotmail.com, and uh, I'll be uh, happy to respond to you. Love to get some interaction here. And we are going through the wisdom literature. We're going to be finishing up the wisdom literature today with the book of Job. Now, I've been, I've been taking these books in order, and I leave the book of Job last because of all the wisdom literature books, it is the book that is probably the most real. Um, it deals with the whole concept of suffering and why is there suffering in the world. Um, Remember, Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes kind of go together. Pro Proverbs talks about the way things ought to be, the way things should be. They're not promises, they're not laws, but it talks about how if you fear God, life will be like this. If you walk in his commandments, life should be like this. Uh, Ecclesiastes talks about how the things in life that we think are meaningful are oftentimes meaningless. It's they're here and then they're not. Uh, but worshiping the Lord and following his commands is eternal. Love is eternal. His love is eternal. And now we get into Job and these are the way things really are. Uh, Proverbs is the way things ought to be. Job is the way things are because we all deal with suffering. We all deal with things that uh, that go wrong. Some people suffer greatly in this world through no fault of their own. Some people suffer very little in this world and they seem to be kind of creeps. Uh, why is that? Well, the book of Job is going to address a lot of that. Um, remember our talk about Hebrew wisdom literature and how wis wisdom literature works in the Hebrew tradition that they will talk about things over and over again in different ways and rehash it and look at it differently. A lot of people get bogged down in the book of Job because there's lots of back and forth between Job and his friends, and we'll talk about that in a second. And it seems like they're getting nowhere, and that's kind of the point. And as we get into it, uh, you'll get an idea of why this is important and how you can really draw an awful lot out of there. I will also say offhand that one of the best commentaries on the book of Job is Dr. Michael Brown's commentary on Job, and I'll put a link to it in the, in the show notes. Um, that is well worth reading. It's a little academic, but he does an amazing job of looking at this book. So some things to think about when reading the book of Job. Don't read Job as history. Uh, read it as an ancient Jewish philosophical fable. All right. That may bug some of you a little bit. So let me explain myself here. Whether or not these things actually happened isn't as important as the story's meaning. And that's what a fable is all about. A fable tells a story, sometimes using fantastic imagery. And the beginning of Job and the end of Job has a lot of fantastic imagery. But the whole point of it is to give us a main meaning that we are to take away from it. So if you have a hard time with the idea of the throne of heaven and Satan coming up before God and God then speaking to Job at the end, put that aside. Read it as though it's a fable and it's trying to give you a meaning. Um, the other thing to keep in mind throughout all this, Job, the character of Job was upright, yashir. He was safe, straight, correct, honest. And he was blameless, Tom. That means without guilt. These are keys to understanding Job's side of the argument. He keeps saying over and over, I am Yashar and I am Tom. I am honest, straight, correct. Now I am blameless. I didn't do anything to, do, to bring on the suffering that has come upon me. So we start with the heavenly realm, the Ben Elohim. So the Ben Elohim are all of the heavenly creatures that are surrounding God. And the Ho Satan, and we've talked about this sneaky dude 
a lot. He is the accuser, and he states that Job only loves Yahweh because Yahweh blesses him. So all the angels are gathered, and God is looking at his marvelous creation, and he's looking at Job, this wonderful, blameless, upright fellow. And the, the Satan says, the sneaky guy says, well, he only loves you because you, you reward him. Look at how comfortable he is. Look at his wonderful life. He's rich. He's got a big family, sons and daughters. You know, he is just having it up, and why shouldn't he love you? So let's see what the accusers is, is doing. God prom promises blessings for those who are obedient and faithful. And the enemy twists that promise and says that people who love and obey God will quit loving Yahweh if the promise isn't immediately kept or interrupted. So in this story, God removes that blessing from Job, and Job is set into financial familial and health ruin he is completely destroyed as a man other than his life his health is destroyed he loses his whole family in fact his wife tells him curse god and die you know nice huh uh he and you know, all his children are killed he loses all of his wealth and he sits there in the muck and the mire and he is surrounded by three friends. Wonderful. What follows are three sets of arguments. And it follows a pattern. A friend makes an accusation to Job. Nice friends, right? Job then responds. And the next friend makes an accusation. And then Job responds. And it goes over and over again. So Job's friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and Elihu. Like Job, all were not Israelites. None of these are Israelite names. Isn't that interesting? So all four friends of Job, and Job himself, start with an important presupposition about Job's suffering. That presupposition is this. Good things happen to good people, Bad things happen to bad people. All five of these guys attempt to answer this question. Is God just? Does God run the cosmos on a strict principle of justice? How do you explain Job's suffering? Is God just? Does God run this universe in a way that is according to his strict principle of justice? and what explains Job's suffering? So Job's argument. This is his argument to his three friends. And to God. I'm innocent. My suffering isn't just. Therefore, and I'm using Western logic here to sum up. Therefore, God does not run the universe according to strict justice or God is not just. So Job calls in to question God's character. The friend's arguments, all, all four of them have this argument to one degree or another. God is just. God runs the world according to his justice. Therefore, Job, you've sinned. Now, Eliyahu, the last one, the young guy at the end, he sort of states it a little bit differently. He says, therefore, God has something that he wants to teach Job about his character as a warning for future sin. Eh, thanks, pal. Now, that, so even though Job says, I'm innocent, I didn't do anything to deserve this, his friend said, well, you must have really because this is how the universe works. At the end, Chapter 31, Job demands a hearing before God to plead his case. So think of this court of justice. And Job is banging his hand. I'm innocent. My suffering's not just. You either don't run this universe according to strict justice or you're just not just yourself. Job 41, 1 through 5 is 
Job's response. And God invites Job to run the universe for a day. Who are you? So, God's answer to Job. He says, look, I am God. I am infinite. I created everything. I have an infinite and universal perspective. And who are you again, Job? Let me read Job 41 through 5 because this really does get to the heart of Job's answer before God. Or this is this is what God answers to Job. Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who argues with God give an answer. And here's Job's answer. I am so insignificant. How can I answer you? I place my hand over my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not reply twice, but now I can add nothing. That's Job's response. Standing in the light of God is God, he is infinite. He has infinite universal perspectives. And we are not God. Uh, Job chapter 40 verses 14 through 24. 41 talks about behemoth and leviathan. These are two chaos creatures that frequently poke up in, in scripture. And they're quite tame. They're quite tame in in this particular um, in this particular passage, because God created them. They're part of God's creation, even though they represent chaos, even though they represent evil. They're tamed by God. God is in control of everything. He allows. He doesn't allow. But He's infinite. He has universal, infinite perspective. Job's final response comes in chapter 42. Let me just go to that real quick. After all God has said to him, he says, I know you can do anything, and no plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this who conceals my counsel with ignorance? Surely I spoke about things I, do not, I did not understand, things too wondrous for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. When I question you, you will inform me. I heard reports about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I reject my words and am sorry for them. I am dust and ashes. So, after all of this, Job repents for calling into question God's character. And Job is restored. He's given a double blessing. He's given more more uh, wealth he's given a, uh, his family back um, he's given comfort again he's give, he's restored in his health he didn't earn it this isn't something that was earned god gave it to him so what are we supposed to take from all of this what do we do with the book of job when we're with someone who is dying of cancer and in great pain and says why is God doing this to me I think the first thing that we need to keep in mind is that suffering is a necessary part of being in a fallen world we are in a fallen world we are not in the state that God created us to be in and any kind of suffering that we might have in this life is not something God desires. It may be something God allows to happen, but it's not something God desires. The second thing we ought to keep in mind is that our suffering is temporary. Our suffering lasts only a little while. Remember with the book of Ecclesiastes, how our lives are but vapor that they're there and then they're not. Our suffering is temporary. When we stand before a holy God, when we end this life, we are going to be before him. And if we've put in our faith, hope, trust into Jesus, 
our suffering will be at a complete and utter ending. No more tears, no more sorrow. The other part is that when we ask the question why, we kind of want to sit in the seat that God has. We want answers that maybe we're not supposed to have. And that seems really insufficient, doesn't it? When we're looking at a loved one or we ourselves are going through suffering and somebody says to us, well, maybe you're just not supposed to understand it. There's a lot of truth in that. There's not a lot of empathy in that either. But the whole point is that God has a much bigger perspective than we do. And God has this. If you are suffering, if you are going through illness, if you're going through something that is terrible, that you had nothing to do with, that it was of no fault of your own, just know that God loves you. He has a bigger perspective than you. He has better things for you. Putting your faith, hope, and trust in him may alleviate some of your sorrow, uh, suffering. God does heal. Sometimes you have to suffer a little bit more. I know of people that need inner healing. Inner healing is when you have memories or trauma. And in order to be healed from memories and trauma, you need to go through them and be healed. And that can be very, very painful. God wants to heal. And he sometimes wants to heal on this side of eternity. Sometimes he wants to heal on the other side of eternity. But God loves each and every human being on this earth. And those that put their faith, hope, and trust in him will have an end to their suffering. That's a good note to leave on. Job can be kind of dark, but I think he leaves on a beautiful, beautiful note. God's perspective. Remember, God has the eternal perspective. Let me know what you think. Put some comments in the comment section. Uh, if you like this, like and subscribe the video on YouTube. And uh, we're going to be moving out of wisdom literature and getting into the prophets. Yeah, them weirdos. Uh, we're going to be talking about the prophets and uh, starting with the major prophets into the minor prophets. And after we finish the minor prophets, we head into the New Testament. We're getting close, aren't we? Well, that's it for this week. Um, I'll see you again next week. Until then, God bless.